watching the wild animals that flock to the park. But the Spaldings never expected that one would become a house guest. The backyard of Ruth and David Spaulding's Fort Lauderdale home borders a 180-acre state park. For years, they'd enjoyed watching the wild animals that flocked to the park. But the Spaldings never expected that one would become a house guest. Them up in his front paws, and, and that's why we find a lot of uh, mangoes down there. That well, we can't. don't worry about it, they don't eat much. We're kind of like, come on, pick that <laughs> come on, let's go back and read the paper and worry about something else. Ruth and I were sitting in the living room here. She said, I heard something strange out back. Maybe you better see what it is. This was at 10.30 at night, and it was very, very dark. So I turned on a flashlight, and there was a beautiful gold snake that was wrapped about five times around a raccoon that he had just killed. Ruth! I was very startled. I mean, this was something different from the other animals. This I saw with my own eyes. Now, where the heck? It was right. She came out there with me just in time to see the tail of the snake disappear under the house. Uh, Ruth called 911, and the, uh, the police uh, said they don't handle snakes. The Spaldings had no idea how big the problem was, but fearing it could be dangerous, they warned their nearest neighbors. The neighbors next door, the Spaldings, had called us and warned us that they had spotted a snake in their backyard the night before. They said they saw a huge snake eating a 30-pound raccoon. We automatically feared for our children. We have a child that's smaller than what that snake was eating. Until they could find someone to help them with their unwanted house guest, the Spaldings built an elaborate trap designed to keep the snake contained under the house. We felt that he couldn't bother anyone else, but we did find one morning that he had broken out uh, through it at a different point and was uh, probably into the park after raccoons. I really, uh, really felt that it was uh, at least 20 feet, and uh, although other people didn't, uh, didn't believe me. We kind of brushed it off a little bit, you know, sure, there's a large snake, show us. As time went on, they did show us. When we saw the snakeskin, that made us believers. We got the name Todd Hardwick from uh, the Science Museum, uh, and we did wonder about the name. Pesky critters. We're nuisance wildlife trappers when animals, uh, primarily in an urban situation, get into a conflict with the uh, homeowners. I am hired to go out and solve the conflict, and uh, it's our policy here to always solve the conflict by taking the animal alive and relocating it to a better environment. We handle everything from buffalo all the way down to possums, bobcats, and everything else. We don't do dogs and cats, but that's about the only thing we wouldn't do. Todd went to the Spaldings' house to see if this was just another big snake story with Tom McClellan, an expert in snakes. We uh, went out the backyard and we saw a trap. It was set up to catch the snake. It was humorous. It was made out of 3 8 inch plywood. And for a snake of this size, just crawling in there and expanding its coils would have blown the sides right out of the cage. The Spaldings explained that the snake had even used the trap to shed his skin on, as if to mock their trap. To make fun of it, he shed his skin on top of it. The size of the scales in the middle of the back gave me an idea it was definitely in excess of 18 feet. And by the pattern that was on it, I knew it was a reticulated python. And I told this to Todd, and he had said, well, you know, what are reticulated pythons like? And I said, uh, they're usually nasty. My heart began to race, and I began to have many, many thoughts racing through my mind as to what was going to unfold that day and in the following days. The Spaldings had lined toothpicks in front of the hole so that we could tell if the snake had gone in. And indeed, all the toothpicks were laying bent down, pointing under the house. I'm going to take a look under here and see what it looks like. It's a fairly active tunnel under here. 
What's it look like? Well, it, it's really smooth. Looks like she's been coming through here on a very regular basis. It was a small chamber, and there was another hole going under another floor joist into another area. So rather than waste time digging into this area when we just have to dig into another one, we uh, examined some blueprints of the house that the Spaldings happened to have and decided that around the corner was the best place to dig because it would put us in the largest chamber underneath the house and give us access to all the other individual areas. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead down in and see what go I ahead. can see. I was aware of the size of the snake. Not many people were. To have two people go under the house and get in that enclosed area with a huge snake uh, seemed to me to be <laughs> a very unwise thing to do. Our plan at that point was to go under the house, uh, assess the situation, determine where the snake might be, but not confront it. Wow. We had no idea what was going on under there. We were very concerned and felt that we were responsible having let these fellows go under. Look at this hole over here, Tom. Looks like he comes out and heads in your direction. You got a first hole right next to me. I tell you what, I'm gonna... There's a musk that snakes give off, a scent, and it was very strong. You could actually, you could smell the snake in the hole. I think we should leave for today now that we know where she is, because we're not going to be able to handle this by ourselves. To go under the house and, uh, try and handle that animal alone would be idiotic and two would be a little less idiotic but still not smart I'm worried <laughs> she's in there all right when we were greatly relieved to see them come out i can tell you tom and todd had gotten an idea how big this problem was they said they were going to get more help and come back the next day all right, that ought to hold them till tomorrow morning make tracks before rush hour It had taken weeks for the Spaldings to find anyone who'd help them with their snake problem. The day after their scout trip, Todd and Tom returned with reinforcements. Snake hunters Joe Wazalewski and Felix Velez. Of course you were afraid. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. But uh, fear is part of it. We like adrenaline, we like excitement, something different. Coming in. Let's get some of the equipment. Since we clearly did not know what would happen, we wanted to be prepared for everything. So we had an excessive amount of equipment. Okay, you guys move a little bit. Here I come. You guys see anything yet? All right, Joe. That was the worst part of the whole day, getting in that little hole. There you go. Being in little closed places drive me crazy. I just felt this whole house collapsing in on me. That was rough, I'm telling you, you what, we're all a little scared, let's face it, I'm not lying to you, <laughs> sure, it was exciting, it was scary, anybody would be scared in there, I don't care what you say. This is it, Todd, huh? Yeah, that's the hole. We, we approached the hole where we thought the snake was, and at that point we decided that we should take rocks and block off all these other holes of escape, and also at that point Tom and Felix began to enlarge the snake's entry into the second chamber. Well, what do you think, Tom? Big enough, you're gonna hit it? I had a lot of really terrible thoughts. I was uh, terrified of the thought that the second Tom's head appeared in that chamber, that if the snake were laying close, it would instinctively strike at him and he would take a strike in the face or in the throat. I got a visual. Big. Big. Big snake. It was bigger than I thought it was. I knew it was over 18 feet just from looking at the skin, but he had to take a step back and look at this thing. <laughs> it was an impressive animal. You got it? I immediately realized that the size of this snake and how far we were from the original hole, it was going to be impossible to wrestle that snake into a sleeping bag and drag him back out of that chamber the way we came in. Well, I'm getting out of here. So at that point, I suggested that myself and Joe, who was obviously the most claustrophobic at that time, we exit. And looking at the possibility of coming in from the other side of where the snake was, go over here and get him the Tom was explaining he thought he saw light coming in. I'll show you where that is. Yeah. the other hole there, huh? Yeah. 
it comes at you, let me know. I'll pull you out by the legs, Tom. You'll be the first one I call. All right, pass me some of that stuff. Here. We left Tom and Felix there to keep their eye on the snake, and I was uneasy about that because I was worried that if the snake got hostile towards them, that it was just those two, which we never wanted just two people down there. So when we got out front, I was very anxious to dig that opening as fast as we could. And I was extremely nervous not knowing what was going on down there with those two guys. It's great. Uh, hang me down a little, little bit more. I, I need like one more foot. Can you guys hang me down a little more? Okay, I see her. Can you guys get her to come around to the right a little bit? And as I was lunging in to get it by the head, it occurred to me that my boots might slip off when these guys went to pull me out, and I would then be virtually tumbling in on the snake's lap. And the snake suddenly turned in a position to come up towards my face. And at that point, I had an opportunity to get the snare around his neck and cinched it up tight. We got him pulled. All right, we got you. He's got it. Go, 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 go. Okay. There it comes. One maneuver. The crowd was screaming. People were tripping on themselves, retreating from where we were. They had been jockeying for position all morning and suddenly realized they didn't want to be up close. It had undoubtedly either been turned loose or it escaped. It's not the snake's fault for being under that house. The blame for that snake being loose rests solely on the person that either allowed it to, to escape or turned it loose. That's the person to blame for it, not the snake. It kind of boggles our imagination to feel it, that for 15 to, to 18 years, we, we were not aware that the snake was here at all. When it was all over, this snake story had a happy ending for everyone, but especially for Todd and his new roommate, Big Mama. 21 foot, 250 pound python. If I had one word to sum up the whole thing, I would say great, because I wouldn't have missed this for a world. I couldn't think of any place I would have rather been at that moment than under the house with that snake. <laughs>